Good afternoon. I'm Iris Wilbur Glick, Vice President of Louisville Forum. Welcome to our June uh, two, uh, 2022 meeting. Uh, we meet on the second Wednesday of each month at Vincen uh, Vincenzo's Restaurant in downtown Louisville, and all are welcome. Founded in 1984, the Louisville Forum is a nonpartisan public issues group that hosts debates and discussions of contemporary and sometimes controversial public policy issues that affect the greater Louisville community. For more information on the Louisville Forum, our programs, or to make reservations, please visit louisvilleforum.org. Today, we are discussing the future of downtown Louisville. Is it bustling or busting? The vacancy rate for Class A office space downtown remains at near record levels. After protests left some buildings boarded up, and the pandemic sent workers home, how is downtown Louisville emerging from the disruptions of the last couple of years? Here to moderate and introduce our panelists is Editor-in-Chief of Louisville Business First, Shay Van Hoy. Thanks, Iris and Louisville Forum. I'm happy to be here uh, filling in and guest moderating today. Uh, I'll also uh, talking about windows boarded up, some good news from across the street. We're in Meidegger Tower that the uh, boards that were back on CBS are now off again. So we've got glass and less, less boards downtown. So, uh, so that's your news update from today. Uh, you know, we have a great panel today that Louisville Forum has assembled. Uh, any discussion, I'll start by saying we'll uh, the downtown workforce has to include Humana, Louisville's largest employer. Uh, we're joined today by Humana's Brad Keller, who's Associate Vice President, Space Planning and Strategy. What does Nashville-based Samara Road like about downtown Louisville that it decided to not only purchase the former PNC Plaza skyscraper for $22.5 million, but invest another $16 million in renovations for the now renamed 500 West Office Tower? Well, well, sorry, we'll hear from Samara Road's Vice President for Acquisitions, Andrew Marchetti. And we'll start our opening mark, remarks with a person whose job is to advocate for downtown economic growth, enhancements, and appeal. Rebecca Flyshaker became Executive Director of the Louisville Downtown Partnership in November. Uh, so now we'll start with opening remarks for a couple of minutes each. Uh, Rebecca, okay. we'll go with you. Uh, good afternoon. Good to be with you. Can you hear me? Can everyone hear me? Okay. Hold on, rearranging the table. Is this better? 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 Okay. I can hear an echo now. Okay, thank you. Um, so I started in December, not that that's much difference, but I've been on the job for about five and a half months. And um, one of the reasons I really, really wanted this job in the first place is because for downtown to be vibrant, we need people. People make the vibrancy. Um, and I think Iris actually said it in her opening remarks, uh, Louisville Forum is for everybody. Downtown is for everybody. It's the only neighborhood that really can be home to everybody, no matter what you uh, do as a profession, or if you don't have a profession, no matter where you live, no matter what you look like, no matter who you love, how you pray, et cetera. It's the only neighborhood where that is true for everybody. Um, other neighborhoods are great, um, but it's where you live or it's where you do um, um, shopping at boutiques that are along a commercial corridor that are really kind of just for that neighborhood. So starting from that premise where um, downtown is a very small landmass, um, half a square mile or so, um, it also pr uh, produces the highest revenue, um, has the highest number of attractions, the highest number of hotel rooms, the highest number of visitors, the list goes on. So for what we um, want you to come and be able to experience, um, it's important that what does happen here, everybody knows, supports the rest of the community. So any strong, and that's true nationwide, that's not Louisville, any downtown is your center of your community. It is your core, and it is where um, you've got a commerce center, entertainment center, your social center. Um, it's just a place that you want all these things to happen. So coming out of COVID um, and social protests, it was an interesting time to take this job. And I think for me, uh, what I really wanted to start with when I hit the ground was, let's get to the basics. We need um, people to feel like wh where they're walking is clean, it's safe, and it looks attractive so that you want to come downtown. <clears throat> and I'm working on a couple of special um, projects that, to, that will hopefully increase more people in downtown. So housing is really important. I know that will come up later. 
Um, and then the other, the last thing is I really want there to be more positivity about downtown. When you start your conversation off about, in a negative way about your own center city, that's contagious. And if you can flip that script a little bit and talk about the good things that are happening in downtown that we can share together, and hopefully that you're here because you want to hear about good things in your downtown, that that's contagious too. And I think we just need to be able to put a smile on what we're doing. Yes, there are things that happen that aren't um, ideal, that's in any big city, you're gonna have that. But how do we react to that and how do we um, work together to promote it and be able to bring people together as a community, as a society, no matter how different we are, that we can enjoy our time together. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Andrew, up, you're up next. Perfect. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, as Shay mentioned, my name is Andrew Marchetti. I'm a Vice President of Acquisitions and Development for Samara Road. Uh, Samir Road is based in Nashville and in New York, and we are invested in over 50 markets across the country, and over the last five years have invested over $2.5 billion in real estate across those markets, uh, many of which is, is, uh, is part of the Optus sector. Uh, one of those assets is 500 West Jefferson that we purchased about 18 months ago, and we are uh, nearing completion on a $16 million renovation project that includes a total remodel to the lobby uh, in doubling its size, a barista shop included in that for pedestrians and the public, uh, and a full floor of amenities that includes a rooftop terrace. So excited to, uh, to join our panelists up here. I think we have great perspectives from all, all, you know, all different sectors, and, uh, and I think that everyone will walk away with you know, a, an interesting take on where we're headed with the office market. This is obviously a unique time, both for office, but also for downtowns across the country. Thanks, Andrew. Uh, Brad, how about you? Hey, good afternoon. Make sure we got this. I'm Brad Keller with Humana. I feel like I got to get really close to this microphone. Yeah. Um, I'm with Humana. I've been with Humana for about 10 years and get to be a part of our uh, workplace solutions team, which is our corporate real estate group that oversees all of our properties um, and buildings across the country. As most of you know, Humana has been a long, uh, long time business in Louisville. We're also, we employ about 12,000 uh, employees here in Louisville. This is our hometown. This is my hometown, also grew up here. Uh, so it's been exciting to be a part of the transformation that we've had in a lot of our buildings up and down Main Street um, and across the city. So we see our associates really changing throughout this pandemic, working remotely for the past couple of years, and now we're starting to embrace them back into our buildings, um, getting back together much like this today, uh, being able to have meetings in person together uh, and collaborate together. So happy to share today. Cool, thanks. Uh, the I was going to start with the first question, and then obviously uh, as many audience questions as we can get uh, would be great. Uh, you know, uh, in my role, we get lots of emails, lots of feedback on stories you write, and I think that, you know, one narrative that we've heard with out really much evidence is that downtown is unsafe and it gets said a lot of times by maybe people that don't come downtown or never came downtown. Um, but Rebecca men mentioned positivity and, and us as people who do come downtown spreading that word. So um, I'll kick this off with you, Rebecca. Um, you know, how, what can we do, what can all of us do to kind of uh, flip that narrative and, and get people coming back town, either, either coming back to the office more, visiting, going to concerts, plays, museums, that sort of thing? That's a great question. It's a big one. Um, so number one, I would love to be able to share data that shows the Central Business District's crime stats. It is not um, that high. And I think that people confuse or call downtown different things. It, does, it doesn't have any hard defined boundary. The Central Business District, in my mind, is not what some people think of as the greater downtown area. So I think that's a really, um, uh, a really nice delineation for space that you're talking about. Um, I do think that people who um, sometimes say they don't feel safe, sometimes it's a matter of comfort. So things might look different uh, downtown than they do in your neighborhood or, different, or across a different commercial corridor. And if you're not comfortable, does it actually mean you're not safe? So there's something that we need to look within, what's the difference? Uh, because I think that's just something to pay attention to. Um, I also think that more people on the street, actually this is proven, it's not just that Rebecca thinks so, more people on the street means more safety. So the more people that come downtown, we're kind of building our own uh, future state of how we want downtown to be. It just is less people can get away with not very good behavior if there are more people on the street. It's just kind of the way uh, human behavior is. 
one of the reasons I want to increase the number of our ambassadors on the street is because you have more feet and eyeballs on the street that will really help um, people feel comfortable and also know that if somebody's in a uniform that maybe some unwanted behavior could be could be stymied. So our team works on um, creating that clean, safe environment for you. And I also think that if you're coming downtown and there's more people that are coming downtown around you, that you're going to feel safer. So evenings and weekends, um, if you've been downtown, please do come downtown. By the way, there are shows at Kentucky Center Actors Theater, ball games, soccer, ba uh, baseball. Uh, basketball is about over, but football will be coming back. There are just things that you can do in downtown that really concerts. I mean, that's the love of what I do in downtown uh, in several different places, north, south, um, ends of downtown, that really make a difference because you're, my purpose of, you, of my job is that you're not just coming for that one thing, but that you want to stay or come early and have a drink before you go to your show and then have a drink afterward. And so programming is really important, part of what I'm working on in terms of helping increase that narrative of safety, but also fun things to do that will get more people down here, which will then make people feel more safe. <laughs> and uh, Brad, I wanted if you could follow up on that a little bit. Um, in your discussions uh, with your employees and your teams, uh, you know, Obviously, you've kind of got your return to work plan now, and we can talk a little bit later about your physical space and what that transformation has looked like. But how about just, um, you know, the importance for uh, such a vital company in Louisville to find ways to try to get people back into the office as much as, you know, as much as you can. Or as we talked about, there are workforce challenges that come up with that, too, where if someone feels like they're forced to do something they don't want to do, they're going to go look for another job. So balancing that. Yeah, absolutely. You know, one thing that the pandemic has taught us all across the country and all across the globe is that that. Work can be conducted remotely, right? A lot of people are successful. It was awkward at first uh, as somebody who had to sit at a dining room table for a couple weeks until we figured things out. Um, and then people have settled in. They bought second monitors and they've really set up and, and they're, they're successful in their homes. And now we've opened doors up and said, hey, we'd like you to come back and meet with us. And so we're, we're trying to undo some of what we've learned, but also we have to really look at as to what can we serve? What needs can we meet that they can't be met at home? Right, so a lot of a lot of focus work can be done at home. If you need to get work done and your head's down, that's a great spot for it. But if you're meeting with your colleagues and you're collaborating together, that's not something that's done as easily at home. You can use Zoom, but as, as you guys will all attest right now, it's better to be in person for these conversations. And so how do you bring them in? How do you create those environments that support that? But the other thing we have to really think about is what barriers would prevent somebody? So, Given choice, you have to think about every barrier that might stop somebody from coming in. So it could be as simple as the traffic today. It could be as simple as parking. Do I get to park close to my building? How hard is it to find a conference room? And honestly, one factor is even the weather. We see that sometimes on rainy days, if you're given choice, sometimes people stay home. So one of the things that we look at is how can we make it as easy as possible so that you can find easy parking that you can make it into the room, into the spaces. And we actually have kind of a concierge program that will actually help you find meeting rooms and support that. Meals are easy to be delivered into those spaces so that we can make it a, a seamless environment. Thanks, I found it interesting that like, as we move forward, kids will like not know snow days anymore. Like it's, or, and then workers, you know, it's just not a thing anymore because you can get it done from home. Um, do we have any audience questions as of yet? All right. Uh, this this question is directed to Rebecca Fleischaker. Uh, graffiti has been a real problem downtown, and um, there have been a number of arrests and things of that nature over graffiti that have not been covered by the media. What is the city doing to stop the graffiti that's happening in our downtown? Okay, well, first, uh, Louisville Downtown Partnership is not city government, but we do work very closely together, so I'm happy to answer the question, but I do feel like I need to make that distinction. Um, we, our ambassadors do clean up graffiti in the public right of way. That is something that is our job. We are helping provide that service in addition to uh, graffiti service from the city. So codes and regs, you pay taxes to have graffiti abated. They can't get to everything. We want there to be downtown, a special eyes on downtown and to be cleaner. So we do do that. Uh, the problem is uh, when there weren't as many people on the streets that there was more of this kind of activity, there was more freedom for that kind of behavior. So we are trying to, A, this is another reason we want more people on the streets. You just, you see a lessening of that kind of behavior. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
Um, we are very happy that arrests have been made. I will tell you right now, if you've seen the word bloke anywhere, um, and it's been a lot of places, he did get arrested, which was very good news, uh, and I wish would have made bigger news, because I, I think he was, he was a well-known um, graffiti artist. Um, so we are, there's not a lot of tools that we can do. We try to clean it so that it is, it discourages more of it. Um, we try to help private property owners if it does appear on their properties uh, with painting it. So we would ask the property owner to buy the paint, get the permission for our folks to touch their property, and we will go and paint it. Um, if it's a matter of matching the paint color, we don't do that. The property owner would do that. But we are trying to let people know that we're here to help do that. Because the faster you address it, the, the less it is repeated. Um, and then just we don't have enough police to be on it as a detective to follow each incidence, and the big one that was uh, um, in the news over the weekend uh, at Myers Lofts on Broadway at Brook Street, I think, um, that one is was done from the expressway. So they, they stop, spray, and then drive on, and it's really hard to catch. So if there are cameras on buildings, that's another way that we can help the police try to find it, but um, until we're back up to uh, full force um, on LMPD's force, it's really hard to, to look after every single one of those incidents. Thanks, Rebecca. And, uh, Andrew, I didn't want to get too far down the line before talking some about office space, obviously vitally important to the economy downtown and the foot traffic that that uh, Rebecca and, and Brad have talked about. Um, you know, what interest uh, interested Samara wrote about 500 West Jefferson? And then also, could you give us maybe a broader look at, uh, you know, what kind of the downtown uh, office space, Class A space is right now? Sure, I would say in terms of uh, interest into 500 West Jefferson, you know, we, we looked at the building <clears throat> in the market as one that we thought we could execute a, a, uh, a strategy, a business plan to deliver best in class uh, office space with best in class amenities and be able to compete at a more competitive rate than our competitors in, in, in the market. So from a thesis, that was, that was where we stood, uh, both, both from a qualitative and quantitative perspective. But that we always look at it as if they build it, uh, if we build it, they will come, right? So we, we, it, it's up to us to give companies a reason to be downtown, to be at 500 West. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we're you know, nearing completion of our renovation project. So uh, you know, we're, we're excited about the future for the building and also with downtown, we think that it can not only attract companies from the suburbs, but from other markets that are looking at you know, various cities to, to potentially relocate to or, or add office space to. I'm looking forward to seeing the outdoor yeah. patio space. I know, space I know. It'll be there. great for the summer. We'll throw a big derby well, party, and we'll, we'll invite the forum there here, next year. Here, my my, my uh, ask is Louisville needs more rooftop like rooftop bars, rooftop attractions. So anyway, there's my plug. Rebecca, it's on you. you. You're on it. All right, uh, some more audience questions. we have any more? We have a number of questions from members of the forum wanting to know about, in general, how we compare to other major cities in our region. So specifically for Mr. Manchetti, since you've uh, lived in Nashville, can you explain what Nashville is doing that we're not to attract downtown business? Uh, what, what percentages of those workers are now in Nashville staying home as opposed to coming back to their workplaces downtown? Sure. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a, you know, I think, complex question. Uh, I would say from a state level, they have been very aggressive in uh, you know, corporate relocations and, and investments into companies that are, are coming to Nashville. So when you look at the Amazon uh, relocation or, or HQ2 and the component that's in Nashville, 5,000 jobs. When you look at what Oracle is doing, a regional headquarters, 8,000 jobs. And that's just from those two companies. So there is a you know, multiplier effect, uh, companies that need to be located in around those. To, uh, to also have an impact on the city. So you know, those two alone could have turned into 20, 22,000 jobs for, the, for, for Nashville. Um, I would say, you know, for Oracle, they're obviously underway on a, a massive regional headquarters, uh, a decision they've made recently after COVID um, or after, you know, shutdowns and things of that nature. Uh, so I think that they are, they're finding it to be important that people are in the office, collaborating, innovating, and, uh, and also, I, I feel from an uh, employee perspective, uh, a sense of camaraderie, uh, not only with those you work with, but also with potential mentors of yours, advancing careers. Um, you know, I think everyone has a different take on it, but 
you know, it seems that Oracle finds that to be important for, for future innovation and things of that nature. And Rebecca, would you like to follow up on that a little bit, just about, you know, there's this constant comparison, but yeah. very different cities, yeah. um, you know, very different maybe leisure travel uh, targets. So uh, just, I'm sure you hear it a lot and yeah. probably would like to share on it. Sadly, yes. <laughs> um, and I also think that, um, it, so I used to be uh, chief of Louisville Ford and head of economic development for the city. And what I always used to say, and I probably should still say it, often is economic development begets economic development. So the, it's kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy. In Nashville 20, 30 years ago when HCA located there, it just changed the whole trajectory of corporate relocations and attractions. And what's happened is because you start to get this uh, really exciting city, city center is that other people want to be a part of that. So how can we activate our downtown and have a nice balance of tourism, businesses, residents that creates that same kind of energy that attracts more? So it really is um, you're creating now what you want it to be more of. So Nashville's much bigger than us. Um, they also, I will say on the other side, which gives us a little comfort, is that their cost of living has gone through the roof. Housing is very expensive. Uh, transportation has gotten much more difficult because of it. So in Louisville, we can plan for that. We are built in much, uh, infrastructure-wise, in a much better way than Nashville was. Um, and so we still compete with them because it's easier to live here. So if we can talk about that ease of living um, and the choice to be in a navigable um, city where uh, public officials are accessible, where you can make a difference in your community, I still think that this is a very um, smart choice and a great place to be. Nashville just has a lot more money in it um, from from corporate um, uh, executives to investments they make to uh, music music really um, in their city and uh, professional sports too. Yep. Thanks. Uh, another audience question. Uh, members of the forum would like to know um, what is our crime rate in Louisville like compared to Nashville, uh, Indianapolis, Cincinnati, and and specifically the one one question was about the murder rate in Louisville compared to other cities in the region. Do the panelists have any statistics there? I, I don't think we do. That's a comparison I'd love to get and report back to the forum. Um, and in bigger cities, your, your crime rate's going to be higher, uh, generally speaking. But I think that's a, a good comparison that we can look at. And do you mean like the whole city, whoever asked, is that the whole city or downtown? Well, specific to downtown. Okay. Yeah, I'll, uh, I will talk to Chief Shields and get some information. Another question um, on the business side of things from our friend at Humana. What is Humana's uh, long-term plan in investing in the downtown real estate space? Uh, that's a good question. We've been in this market for quite a long time, as you, as you know, building this building uh, behind us in 1985. Um, and we continue to invest in our spaces. I think one of the upcoming questions, not that I was peeking at the list here over my shoulder, but <laughs> it is about some of our investments we've made, so I'll go there quickly. Uh, we, we have just finished two really exciting, by the way, a plug for uh, Business First. If you pick up uh, Business First this week, right? Yeah, uh, online, well, anyhow. Online for, uh, so yeah. <laughs> online, you'll see all the photos of the, these investments. Uh, we just finished two major renovations for us that really went throughout the pandemic. We took the opportunity to do some major construction uh, and major investments in our buildings. Uh, honestly, it's easier to um, do HVAC and elevator upgrades when the buildings are empty. So we took advantage of a lot of that downtime uh, to do some long overdue maintenance as well as some big renovations. So in the building just behind us and actually right above us, uh, literally, uh, we did a major renovation for a meeting center, which I was up there this morning. It's full. Um, and then down the street in our waterside building, uh, which many of you know, the big box down the street by the park, uh, we did two full floors there, which is almost 100,000 square feet of renovation. Um, so our commitment is to these buildings and to the environment. Again, with over 12,000 employees here, we really want to create a space where, where people can gather and collaborate together. Um, but that said, we, we are rethinking the office space. It's no, no longer the environment of um, a requirement to come in and sit in a seat uh, 40 hours a week. Oftentimes now we're supporting a remote first where people are coming in and using these spaces as um, alternative spaces to, to work. Um, oftentimes you may have internet issues or uh, if you're like me, guest at your house and you want to get away, uh, you come into the office and work um, as well as just meet with your team, meet with your, your peers together. And just a quick follow-up, what's your favorite, like, physical aspect of the renovation? Well, I, I will say, just, it's timely. 
I was working right behind those, uh, those doors earlier today in our open uh, courtyard. Uh, it's good weather today, um, and so being out there is a great spot. Um, just above that, we have a nice fireplace lounge area. It's just different. It's like working sort of in a Panera or in a Starbucks kind of um, loungy space. It's not about cubicles and offices quite as much anymore. Thanks. We have another question for the audience. So a corollary to that is a number of members of the forum would like to know about how we incentivize workers who are obviously en enjoying working from home. We, we are not maybe those people, but we know those people in the office. <laughs> and what are we doing to incentivize those people as employers to come back to work together? Can we take that one? Sure. Um, at least for our, from our perspective, a lot of it's kind of event-based uh, attendance. So when we put on different kind of, whether it's um, a work session together, people are coming in for those events. And I want to give you a real-time example that I'm kind of excited about. Uh, right now, as we speak, we have 100 employees that are um, working outdoors at Louisville Slugger ball field. So this is an outdoor office day for us. Fortunately, the weather has cooperated so far today. It may turn later. Um, but we have 100 in the morning and 100 in the afternoon. And we have a session where people can just go work out there. And so we're continuing to rethink what it's like. You know, so it's not just about drawing them into your traditional spaces, but it's about doing something different. And then they can stay and uh, enjoy the game tonight. Can I add something? I was going to add uh, one other thing. Uh, he's he right. It is events and programming, and I've said programming before. Part of what we're doing from Louisville Downtown Partnership is things during the middle of the day or at happy hour time. Um, so I don't know if you guys pass 4th Street between Jefferson and Market, but we have Food Truck Wednesday. It's the second uh, week we've done it. It's a weekly thing every Wednesday through October. Uh, we know that it's the highest number of employees already in downtown, but we're hoping if people are on the fence about which days to come to the office, maybe Wednesday will be one of them. Um, it was also to answer the call for when we have large conventions in our restaurants that aren't still have workforce capacity issues, that it would help take the pressure off of them. Um, we'll be announcing some other things like that too, but really things that make downtown fun and like if I'm going to be downtown and I can do this other thing, what's that add-on that makes it worth coming to the office for? A perfect example was uh, our publisher last week bought lunch for anyone who came to go to food truck nice. uh, Wednesday. Okay. So like I think 10 or 12 of us came. There's only 19 of us, so that's like more than half. Um, Thank you. Yeah, that's Andrew, good. I was going to follow up with you and uh, kind of to piggyback off what Brad said. What um, from, from the... Um, from your state, from the real estate side, what uh, amenities, changes, alterations are tenants asking for, or, or are you, uh, you know, seeing as a vision to attract more tenants in? Sure. You know, I think if, as I think about our renovation project and the environment that we're trying to create in the lobby, much to what Brad said, you know, we, we think of that lobby space as almost a boutique hotel, one that you can come get coffee, have a meeting, if you have a meeting in downtown but not you know, in an office downtown, or if you're a tenant in the building and you want somewhere that's a little bit more relaxed. Um, and as far as the fourth floor, you know, we have training rooms where people can huddle up. We have conference rooms if you need one. We have a, a fitness facility with pri private locker rooms and showers, uh, but also you know, tenant lounge and our rooftop terrace. And we think that the rooftop terrace is a great amenity for people to be able to come. They have a client or a friend, a colleague, it's downtown, hey, come over to 500 West and, and enjoy. Maybe it's you know, a happy hour on a Friday outside. Uh, in terms of, of, of how we are seeing tenants approach their, their actual floor plan and the space plan, uh, you, you are seeing, you know, I, I think back before uh, the pandemic, and there was a lot of, uh, you know, we had this fad over a very open office space, um, and, and that was, I think, for five years, a, a lot of the direction that we were headed. And before the pandemic, you started to see a lot of studies and data and, 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 and articles around, is that the right decision? Is this, is this impacting productivity? Uh, we didn't get to see how that ended up playing out because the <laughs> pandemic, uh, of course, took over. But, uh, you know, I, I, we are seeing, you know, R.B. Baird, for example, just did a massive renovation to five floors of the building. Uh, interior offices, uh, making sure that open air, that light, all natural light can flow through and, and, and be there for employees that don't have an office space um, and with plenty of meeting rooms. So this is a place where they want to collaborate. Uh, look at the wellness and health of their employees, um, and it's not so much as open format, uh, but places that people can gather, huddle up, in a more you know natural light area for for employees. And I think that that trend will will continue. Great. Uh, another question from the audience. 
There have been a number of questions that hover around the same theme that you're picking up on, which is quality of space for employees downtown. So one question that just came in is on daycare. There have been another, uh, a number of questions about providing affordable housing that's closer to downtown so people can get here. Comments from the panelists, any of them, on how we influence quality of care down, quality of experience downtown. Okay, I'll start. Um, so <clears throat> one of the things that we really want to look at, and this is not just LDP, this really has to be everybody. Uh, when you're talking about downtown, you want to have a healthy diversity of uses um, and a healthy density of uses. So I'm talking about we have employer base, we have residents, we have tourism. Um, and our, and uh, to your point about housing, we don't have a lot of housing. Uh, we have a lot of high-end housing. That was an effort that started in early 2000s. Um, and what I really would like to see is um, we are trying to help uh, advocate. I cannot lobby. I'm not a lobbyist, but help advocate for new tools that would encourage or incentivize housing. We know that we've got some underutilized uh, mid-rise office buildings that can be turned over pretty easily, not like office towers, that could be housing. And how can we create tools that would help a developer close their gap on their financial, their capital stack? Uh, we're working on some tools that Ohio has, and we're trying to copy them in Kentucky. Um, I'll give you all information to go talk to your legislators when it's time, but it is something that we have to take through the state to, to do. Um, and I think that having that mix of uses, daycare is one of them, um, is something that's going to get, and I keep saying it, more feet on the street. These uses, the diversity of uses and the density of uses means more people will be here um, using these things, living here, um, being walking around, notice things, and hopefully make a much more vibrant, uh, safe quality of space. Um, that's indoor space. Uh, I think daycare um, is, there could be a wellness center or something like that. We did ask for um, ARP funds for that kind of uh, conversion of space. I'm still waiting on that, and I see Councilman Piagentini, no pressure, uh, in the audience. Um, that's something that I think a lot of cities have looked at, is how you can um, convert your office space into something else. Uh, external spaces, public spaces, I think is really important too, because when you're walking on the street, um, you want to be uh, you want to be in a nice area. You want to feel like it's taken care of and tended to. Uh, so we've started with banners and flowers, and we're going to move into some public art projects as well. Brad, did you want to talk about from Humana's perspective on some of the other kind of uh, wraparound services that might be helping out your workforce? Sure, absolutely. I mean, one obvious one is is restaurants. It's a big piece. Uh, to not just the lunch crowd, but also what we're seeing now is people coming downtown and staying for a meeting with a colleague um, or a team meeting after hours. Um, my, my schedule is already filling up with a lot of those, which is nice to see that. And those within walking distance to the office are great. Um, another one that, that I, you might, might find humorous here, and bear with me on this one, is um, honestly that the one tether that keeps people at home is pets. The number of people that have adopted pets um, and or grown very used to their, their pets that they had before, um, there's, we call it pet separation anxiety. Um, and people you know, are, are accustomed to their, their, their dogs, their cats, or their animals. And so honestly, uh, it, that's a hard one to solve, but where there's capabilities and amenities for that too, it kind of falls into that child care, um, pet care kind of issue. We all need our Zoom support cat or dog for those meetings. <laughs> Uh, another question from the audience? Well, one follow-up to that and a specific for all the panelists and probably for Rebecca specifically, a complex question. What do we do about grocery stores in this space? Oh. <laughs> uh, so in my prior life, I worked on grocery stores quite a bit. Um, and we are still uh, wanting to have one in downtown in my, in my new role. It is such a low profit margin. It is a very hard business. Um, and to get the size right, so in an urban setting, you have to have not too big, not too small, that they can make money, but that doesn't take up too much physical land. Um, and you want to be able to have parking. So we are still, we're talking to some developers if that can be a part of their project. Uh, I think uh, we need one in downtown, and it's going to be a matter of, uh, I think incentives because we know that no grocer is going to or operator is going to go anywhere without um, some help for the first couple of years for operations. It's just really expensive to get started. So we'll see if we can get anywhere. Um, but I mean, the city has had uh, money in its budget for 
two and a half years for a grocery, and it's it's been really hard to be able to get um, someone to, to do that. So it's not without trying. I do just want to repeat that uh, we've been at it for since 2018, and it's just hard work. Other question? The next question for our panelists, any advice that you would give to our next mayor on improving downtown? I'm going to let you all go first. <laughs> Uh, I, I would say be outspoken about what's happening downtown, the investments that are being made, and you know I, I do feel that there's a little bit of uh, confirmation bias as it relates to, to safety or, or what is happening downtown. If you see something um, that that uh, you know with respect to safety that leads you to believe that downtown may not be safe, that's going to uh, to play a role in that confirmation bias where you're going to go home, maybe tell your colleagues, your friends that downtown is not safe. You know, I don't feel personally that that is, is the case. Uh, you know, 500 West Jefferson is located directly next to Jefferson Square Park. It looks beautiful. It's a beautiful weather day, and, and, and you know, it, it really does look uh, remarkably better than it did several years back. Um, but, I, I, you know, I would say be outspoken about what's happening. You're, you're seeing Angels Envy with a second renovation of their project. You're seeing Churchill's Down come to downtown and, and, and deliver another destination for the market. You're seeing U of L with a campus that they had recently announced in downtown. So these are all things that we can celebrate. Uh, these are companies that are uh, advocating for downtown. And I'd say you'd be that cheerleader that, that really lets people know that downtown is uh, the trajectory is headed up. I would just echo what Andrew said. You know, it's about bringing people down here. And honestly, I'd say keep doing what we're doing. I think a lot of these events are drawing uh, people in. There is a perception that, that there may be unsafe uh, environments downtown. I think it's a misperception. As somebody who's worked down here uh, throughout a lot of the pandemic, I feel completely safe. I was down here with my family last night. Um, but I think there's that perception. If you haven't come back downtown for an event uh, recently, you may, you may still be stuck with that misperception. And so continue to have a lot of these events and concerts. Uh, sports and draw uh, a lot of our population in, and I think they'll follow so the workers once you come down and realize hey it's, this is a great place to be it's great new restaurants I had a teammate the other day that came downtown for the first time in quite a while and was was kind of saddened to see certain restaurants like the Q uh, where we ate a lot uh, closed up but I said hey did you look around and see all the new ones that have opened up since then and so th a lot has changed it's not the downtown that you left in 2020 it's a different downtown now any mayoral advice Rebecca I don't know that I have advice, but I definitely um, would want the next mayor, and I believe both of them know right now, that downtown, and I said this before, is the center of our community and has to be strong for the whole community to be strong. And there is a sense of, if we're too provincial and worry about our own neighborhood or our own suburb or wherever it is that you live and go home every night, that it takes away from your core of society and your community, and I don't want to lose that. A uh, shameless plug, uh, this Friday our <coughs> special report is on um, affordable housing, attainable housing, and homelessness, and we ask both of the primary mayoral candidates about their thoughts on those and run the, are running those verbatim. So check those out if you, if you want. Well, and that is actually one of the next questions we were going to get to. What can be done about the mental health crisis and homelessness crisis downtown? downtown? How can we, as a community, come around and fix that problem? I guess that's me again. Um, uh, there are a lot of things, but it takes a lot of money. So we are very lucky that we have ARP money, um, American Rescue Plan money this year. A lot of it has gone to um, upping our outreach um, people that can go and talk to uh, people, individuals, homeless individuals in encampments or um, that are on the street. Um, I think that the services, um, we have good services, we just don't have enough. We have beds, we just don't have enough. So the opening of the open, um, what's it called? The Hope Village um, is a great addition to what we have for the spectrum of uh, beds that are needed, and there are different beds. So we need more permanent supportive housing. We just need more places to be able to help people to go with those services. Um, I do know I've been talking to my um, equals in other cities who are in downtowns about how they've their cities have spent ARP money um, or city money, um, and they all, not all, a lot of them have created new outreach positions so that somebody, if we see somebody on the street, I can call my outreach person and say, please go visit them. They're not armed, they're not gonna make an arrest, but they're gonna go talk to them, 
kind of understand what they need, shoot them along if they can, or else call someone to come help them um, and get them to the service they need, which is making a big difference because I think that's the one-on-one -on -one touch that's needed, that you just need more people to do it, and that would be a nice, um, easier way to, something that we could do sooner than later, waiting for the bigger money for more social services and beds. It's, it's a hard one. I mean, you have to treat people with compassion, but you also don't want people living in your street. Shifting gears for just a minute, um, talking about something that a theme that's come up over the last over the course of our discussion here, recognizing that downtown buildings may not be able to return to full usage for office workers. What eff efforts are being made to improve buildings, maybe for residential use potentially, to shift the purpose of the use of space? This question specifically is for really any of the panelists, but for Rebecca or Andrew. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Um, the, so this is what I was talking about. We're looking for some more tools that will help um, for financial incentives. It is expensive to redevelop in downtown. It's expensive to redevelop an existing building, Brad will tell you. It, it's just, it takes more to do that than build new. Um, and in a tight infrastructure and urban space. So I think that we are seeing developers um, go to suburban areas or other places that have open spaces to develop because it's easier. Um, and we know we're losing some of our developers to other cities and states that have these tools. Um, so it's very important, um, in my opinion, um, and I've worked with GLI on this last year and with the city, how we can create tools. And usually these tools are at the state level. It's not, city just doesn't have the a bulk enough money to make that difference. There are some ideas for local tools, though, too, through property tax or something we could do through that, um, to, to be able to close that financial gap. Because if they can't make the project go, they're just not going to do it. So the buildings that can be renovated, we want to be able to say, this can be another use. This can be multi-use. It can have the daycare. It can have residents. It could have retail on the fr first floor. But we need to be able to help them, developers, them, or owners, um, be able to make the, um, the capital stack work. It's just it's expensive. And there's a public good for it. That's why we would put public money into it, city or state, because it actually helps develop downtown and create that density that, again, creates more people wanting to be part of downtown. So what you put into it, you get out of it. I, I had a follow for Andrew specifically. Um, a lot of times you'll hear people say, why don't, you know, well, we've got this office tower and it's half empty. Why don't you just turn it into residential? Could you talk, and we've we've reported on this, could you talk about the the really big hurdles to doing that in a tower? Uh, of just you know taking office space and making it residential. Sure, I, I think uh, the primary would be mechanicals, and, and that's a, a big challenge, and that's one that's very uh, costly, especially when you're using the rest of the building for office space and continuing to do so. Uh, but you are seeing smaller footprint, uh, smaller floor plate buildings. Um, you know maybe they're class B or C, be converted or being looked at as converted. Um, several of which I, in Louisville has been the case, um, either residential or uh, hospitality and hotel. And that is absorption of office space in, in our opinion. Um, and with those smaller footprints, those smaller floor plates, that makes it a bit easier, easier of a challenge. There's also a zoning question um, that makes it difficult to, to convert to office towers because you have to have two separate entrances for residents than the office tower, which also makes it very difficult, which probably goes back to the mechanicals, but uh, zoning is a, <clears throat> that's important to have the separate entrances. Um, a, a more complex question for the panel, and this is for um, anyone. Um, National news saw downtown Louisville over the last the course of the last two years for more than just the pandemic. We were on national news for uh, racial reasons in 2020, and um, the atmosphere was was heavy, and some of that still lingers as people think about their perception of downtown. Um, how do we, as a community, plan a role of of changing that perspective? of seeing downtown Louisville as a safe place to live, to work, and as many of you have said, to bring our families here. Um, I think that um, when we look back at what happened in May of 2020, uh, which was heartbreaking and shocking and scary, 
um, that that has lingered in people's minds, but that that is, really stood out as the only weekend that it was it was like that. And so I feel like we should be able to be um, home to peaceful protests that, for messages that we need to hear. But what it's done, I believe, is made us aware of something that was happening in a way that we hadn't been before. The vocabulary and the conversations definitely changed publicly, which allowed us to talk about things that I don't think we had talked about publicly before. And so for me, and I was a city employee, it was extremely painful. Um, we know that there are changes that are being made at the police department because of that. But for, for socially and community-wise, how can we accept what this is? You don't have to duck your head and be embarrassed of it. I mean, it, 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 it did happen. We can't change that. But let's use that new knowledge and that new conversation to change how we move forward and do it together in a way that we can come across divides and talk about it in a way that we can help each other. And I think that's a new way to, for us to, to live together. There are still people who want to keep it divided. And I think for me, I just continue to say we have to rise above it because we're only as strong as our next neighbor. And we have to do it. We have to be able to be, uh, we live on this earth together. It's the, it is just the way it is. And that's what makes community. And so um, let's be open about it and embrace how we can change what happened, that it doesn't happen again, and be uh, better for it. As a, as a quick follow-up, what, what do you think the uh, extension of water pro, Waterfront Park West and some plans to kind of knock down, you know, Roy Wilkins, 9th Street, that divide, um, although some of those close by areas might not be part of the CBD, what could that do to uh, expand the vibrancy? Because it is, you know, if you, you know, if you drive to West Louisville, there is kind of a hard stop there uh, of, of, you know, that four-lane road that's hard to cross if you're on a bike or on a path. And so what could those two things together mean, uh, you know, for the greater kind of downtown area? Well, connectivity is always good. When you're able to connect uh, neighborhoods, uh, even parking lots, properties, any time that you're able to provide that connectivity, which the park definitely will be, will be doing, I think it makes people curious and will take one step further. So the 9th Street divide that's been called that is getting a huge makeover. Uh, the city's applying for a grant or got money for a grant for to redo that. That's been in the works for a couple of years. That will be huge. I do think as much as we want from the east to the west to feel connected, we have to let the west feel connected to the east. And the downtown, I've said it before, is a place for all, but that people feel like they can, can they can come. So I feel like that's going to if we can make these things happen, they have to be contagious and more have to happen. And Brad said it, we all are in this together and we can all bring improvements to uh, the built environment, or your own building, or your, even your own household and how you talk about um, going a place to a place you haven't been before, discovering a new neighborhood that you haven't d been before. And it's just gonna, t it will take all of us to do that. And I think, uh, Shay, to your, to your point, the the physical connections, and if we can have more of them, will help. On, on the business angle, um, for our largest uh, single tenant downtown, for Humana, um, is there something that the city can invest in to better serve Humana and its business operations? Is, is there space that you need in a building, or how can the city partner better with Humana to incentivize workers to return home, back to work? Did I mention pet care? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, I, I think a, a couple things. One, one barrier, as we mentioned before, is parking. Um, and, and you know, at one point, we occupied 27 different parking garages and structures in downtown. Uh, it's spread out. Um, so parking is somewhat of a, of a barrier when we think about that for our employees. I think the other one, though, is travel. So as, as a company that's headquartered out of here, we often have a lot of travelers that come into the city. And direct connects are always um, the preferred option when you're, when you're pulling in resources. And so the more connector outs, I know we've opened up some new ones recently. Um, I think that helps a lot of companies that are currently here and those that are considering coming into the market. We have um, three questions from, from the forum left. Um, there's been a record amount of money, public capital spending on downtown Louisville. At what point do we acknowledge that some things don't need to be invested in or need to be self-sustaining? And where is that line where we stop throwing money at problems that seem to perpetuate themselves? 
Well, that last part was vague. If whoever wrote that wants to say what that means, I can answer that. But in general, I think um, this comes back down to downtown being so many things for so many people. When you have, uh, it's our front door to the to the entire community, to the entire region. So if somebody's uh, coming in for a convention at the Exposition Center, there's a good chance they're staying downtown or will come through downtown for the amenities. At bourbon distilleries, experiences, concerts, ball games, et cetera, are downtown. Um, there are different kinds of investments that are made by public, by city and state. Um, I believe there is less need for um, incentives to make a project go like the Omni because there are enough of those projects that have happened that there's that density that's happening. So you have a market. Um, but in terms of infrastructure, nobody else is or should be investing in our roads, sidewalks, light pulls, street pulls, that kind of thing. Um, and so that should not, I mean, downtown never stops. There's never, it's never done. Uh, and so I do think that there is a public good that comes out of investment in downtown because you always want it to be relevant, you always want it to be vibrant, and you always want it to be inviting um, to a lot of different kinds of people. Um, so if we talk numbers, I guess you know, we could compare what's being spent in other areas of town versus what's being spent in the central business district. Um, but the central business district is just different than any other area of town. That would be my answer. Um, and Rebecca, one uh, quick follow up for you. The, the 700 block of Main Street, uh, what is the status of the tree guards? That oh my goodness. Somebody's paying attention. <laughs> wow. Um, they're coming back. Um, they were, <laughs> um, Metro Parks had a grand vision for planting four or 500 new trees in downtown, which is laudable and excellent and very exciting. Uh, what didn't happen was conversations with other departments, and we didn't know that this was something that was in their plan to remove all the walking sticks and tree guards. Um, it is part of historically designated area. It has been won awards um, nationally. This was done in the early 90s. Um, they're coming back. <laughs> our, our final question for the panelists, which acts as a nice wrap up, as you see the lens of downtown from your perspectives, what can Louisville best do to improve our regional position as a vibrant, wonderful downtown area? What can we do to position ourselves and strengthen our position? Yep. First. You know, I would say, uh, Continuing what we've been what we've been doing, uh, listening to community leaders, business leaders. I think you know for what Rebecca's done in five and a half months is remarkable. Uh, really taking the bull by the horns. I'll brag on her for for a second here. She she really has done a remarkable job in a short amount of time. Um, but I think it's it, it's trying to get people, trying to get companies uh, from potentially the suburbs to come downtown and be a part of this. And I think as you do that, you'll start to create, look, if you look at a, a uh, live, work, play, stay, uh, CBD, you know, stay, you have destinations and you have hotels. So you've got the last two addressed and we've continued to see development on those destinations and with the hotels. Um, the, the first two, I think, coincide with one another. So it's how do you create an environment that people want to come down and live in and then work in? Um, so, you know, I'd say listening to the business community, listening to community stakeholders, um, and urging people to come from the suburbs, uh, offices to come from the suburbs and be downtown and be a part of the, you know, the, the, the upward trajectory of downtown. I think we've met a lot of people in the business community that do truly care about C the CBD and want to be a part of, uh, you know, the continued solution of, of creating a, a, a very vibrant CBD. I think it's just continuing with that. You want to just go down the line? Sure. Yeah. Uh, there's no one answer. I mean, there's so many things that make up downtown, and you want it to be that way. I mean, again, it's a diversity of density and or di diversity of uses, and you want that will draw a density. So, how do we get more people? And that's what we're trying to figure out. So, housing will do that. We need more housing. We're we know we need more housing. We're behind our peer cities in the number of housing units that we have. Um, and I also think that the more we can fill our office towers, the more people are going to feel like they can live here which isn't really intuitive, but a, you have to have people on the street um, during the daytime for people to feel like they can live there. And so we're, it's attacking all these things at once, but it, so um, housing, getting back to work, um, in, an, in, enough of a, in enough of a 
concentration or a density that is inviting to other people. Brad, how about to close this out for your and, hum and Humana's perspective on this? Sure. Um, you know, one of the things we haven't talked about today is conferences. Um, and, you know, we were really vibrant for quite a long time. Uh, it was, the streets were full. And mm -hmm. I keep thinking about this as you talk about filling the streets. And that's one of the opportunities that I think we have as a city is to bring a lot more of those events in. And that's a great way to fill the streets. And I think it will be kind of a cycle where as you bring more, more people in, the restaurants thrive, more people feel that vibrancy as you come downtown, more workers want to come back and be a part of that vibrancy. So I think it's, it's kind of an easy button that we have right now mm -hmm. um, to really create that energy in our spaces. Um, you know, the other thing too is, is embrace social media for this. I know that sounds weird, but a lot of people are home and not maybe coming downtown. And so what I, I love seeing is when our associates are in the office and they take pictures of themselves in some of our new settings and they're posting it on LinkedIn or on Facebook or Twitter or whatever your social media platform is and they're talking about it and somebody will say, hey, that looks great. I think I might come down next week. And we actually see that, that behavior. So the more that we do that um, as employers, as employees, and as the city does that for events and promoting all the things that are going on, I think it will pull people in to experience those. Um, and lastly, I, I, think, I think Louisville, um, to be honest, is, is needs more venue attraction. You know, what is that that pulls you in? What is the thing that says that you tell your neighbors, hey, you got to see this new place that's been built, right? And you're excited to come down and be a part of. I see a lot of cities um, advancing this as we travel and look at new locations. And I, I think we've got a, a lot of great stuff here, but I'm, I'm ready for the next one, right? What's our next big wow space that pulls people in? Well, thanks to our panelists for the great conversation. Thanks to the forum for inviting me to guest moderate. It was a lot of fun, and I'll turn it back over to Iris. All right. Um, please join me in thanking Shay Van Voy of Louisville Business First for a great job. Thank you. And, and thanks to all of our panelists for being here today. Great discussion. On behalf of the entire Louisville Forum, uh, thank you all for, for joining us today. Our next meeting is Wednesday, July 13th, when our topic will be the consequences and impact of the pending U.S. Supreme Court ruling on Roe v. Wade and the future debate in Kentucky on reproductive health. So um, your QR code's on the table. Please sure to register. Um, it'll be a packed room. Uh, we encourage you to make those reservations in advance. Last Lastly, this fall we will be shifting our luncheon registration and payment to online only, so stay tuned for more information. Uh, thanks again for joining us and we hope you all have a wonderful day.